Okay, so um, this next uh, session um, is, is going to serve to sort of offset uh, what you've heard this morning. Um, I, if I were you and I heard a bunch of us getting up and saying metadata is important, I'd say, you, you would say that, wouldn't you? Because you're at Crossref and you might be a little metadata obsessive. Um, and that's all true. But the key thing here is that we're bringing people from um, other parts of the community who, uh, who are very interested in quality metadata, who are very interested in quality um, in, in, the, in the services that we're providing. And it's my uh, pleasure to introduce uh, first Jody Schneider, who, who my experience of her, uh, and you can look at her bio, I'm not going to repeat that, but my experience of her was that she was like one of the first librarians in the Twitter sphere and blog sphere to, to actually take Crossref seriously and uh, point other people at our services and start using our metadata. And I'm uh, eternally grateful to her for that. And uh, here's Jody. Thanks. Thanks so much, Jeff. It's really a pleasure to be here um, talking to all of you. And um, I'm going to talk about trouble at the Academy problem citations. I want to first of all tell you what my metadata hats are. Um, I'm a, a librarian, a, also a, a professor, so I teach people who want to be librarians, who want to be information managers and data scientists and a researcher in scholarly communication, science of science, ontologies, and related areas. Um, I've also been involved as a journal editor, uh, founding uh, Code for Lib Journal, which is in issue 42 right now, fantastic, um, and being involved with other uh, journals. Of course, like most of us, I'm a metadata user. And mainly I want to talk about bibliographies. Um, so bibliographies to me are really important. The part at the end of the article where you say, um, here is what I have referred to, here's what I've used. Um, and you see that in, in multiple different forms. And, and thanks to the work that uh, Crossref has done and thanks to the contributions of members, we, we have much more useful bibliographies that in many cases take you directly to the item that you're looking for. Um, I'm here today to ask you, um, publishers in the room particularly to take an even more active role in monitoring and tracking bibliographies. That's because to me um, the things that are in bibliographies, those references are essentially um, a key currency in the academic community that, that I'm a part of. Um, of course they're used for, for impact and trying to evaluate people to see if they should get money, to see if they should get tenure and so on and so forth depending from, from place to place. Um, but more importantly, um, we use references to evaluate whether something is believable or not. Um, Bruno Latour has written that you can transform fact into fiction or fiction into fact just by adding or subtracting references. And so it's, it's no surprise that science builds on the past. And what I want to point out is it's exactly references, it's exactly the citations from one thing to another that are um, that building. It's that you have some existing facts or quasi-facts as close as we can get at the moment. Those are the things that you cite then with whatever new information you're putting out. Um, and the problem with that, I mean the, the Jenga here is really deliberate. It's that um, if the things that you're basing your work on don't hold up, um, it could be that the entire stack falls down. Um, and there's a, a, a great uh, letter called Chaos in, in the Brickyard that made this point, um, really looking at, at problems in the way that people were um, managing their contributions. But, but um, uh, Bernard uh, Foster thinks about these bricks called facts and says, if the bricks were faulty or if they were assembled badly, the edifice would crumble. Um, and this could be uh, very dangerous to innocent users of the edifice, right, the scientific structure that we were trying to build, um, and to the builder, who sometimes was destroyed by the bricks. Um, particularly, I want to think about one kind of faulty bricks that we have already seen and identified in our system, retracted articles. Um, articles can be retracted for lots of different reasons. Um, error, sometimes authors will retract their own works, or um, uh, sometimes plagiarism. 
sometimes fraud or duplicate publication, failure to replicate other ethical problems, um, author disputes. Um, often when there's a retraction notice for a variety of reasons, those reasons why something is retracted are pretty vague. Um, and unfortunately, not everything that probably should be retracted is, again, for, for a variety of reasons. Um, for instance, there was a, a study a few years ago of um, United States Office of Research Integrity findings of fraud. Okay, findings of fraud, a third of them in the retractions um, mention misconduct. A third of them um, retract but claim error or loss of data or replication fa failure. And about a third of them aren't retracted or corrected at all. Okay, so, so the retractions are really just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the, these faulty bricks that are there. Um, and they really are treated still as bricks. So first of all, it can take years for something to get retracted. Um, and even after something is retracted, it can still be cited for years and years and years. So why is it that an author would put a retracted article in the bibliography? Most of the time, as far as I can tell from the research that I'm doing, it's because they don't know that the article's retracted. Um, the citations are generally positive and they ignore the known problems with the article. And this is not just in the introduction and background, uh, it's also in the methods, it's also in the results, it's also in the discussion sections. This is really well documented and there's lots of research that's been in the general area of uh, diffusion of uh, retracted research. Citing these things harms people. Um, for instance, and it's, it's most prominent in, in the medical literature when this, when this happens. Um, so there's a, a paper about a clinical trial for renal disease. Um, it was retracted for a variety of reasons, including there was an ethical approval, um, they couldn't verify a statistician was involved, um, and it wasn't, in fact, um, a double-blind study that it was claiming. Even so, right, despite all of these reasons, all of them seem pretty good reasons to not rely on the outcome of the article, um, that study was cited by 173 review articles, um, and it was also cited by follow-up studies, 58 secondary clinical studies that relied on that original paper and enrolled and affected over 35,000 people. Um, they were enrolled in a trial, in trials, where there already was acceptable therapy. Now, of course, many people want to participate in trials, but um, if you're participating because you think you're advancing the science, you're gonna find out more about the uh, disorder that you have, maybe there'll be better treatments. Um, that, in this case, was not true. So that was, at the very best, a waste of the 35,000 patients' time, the time of all of the other people involved in the study, running the study. And um, it, it didn't just affect them, but it also affected um, the, the treatment where um, there was a combination therapy that, that propagated um, and maybe shouldn't have. Um, so you may have seen uh, COPE, the Committee on Publication Ethics. They're really the best source for publishers for information about retraction, when you should retract, what you do, processes to follow, case studies, and so on. So the Committee on Publication Ethics, I highly recommend if you're working in publishing and, and you're not um, aware of this. Uh, I think that uh, publishers really should care about retraction. People say that science is self-correcting. Um, so the question is, is it really? And how long does it take? And um, can, we, can we make it faster, right? We've, we've heard, heard this before today about, um, you know, if, if we have 12 years to, to fix climate change, what if it takes a year to publish things? The same sorts of things happen in, in, many, in many, many fields. We don't just want to self-correct, we want to self-correct as, as fast and as well as we can. Um, with retractions, there is, I think, a, a harm to public health. And whether or not there is a legal liability, um, I certainly see a moral liability for publishers. Um, so you could take the, one of the most famous retracted articles that everyone mentions would be um, the Wakefield 90, 1998 Lancet article that associated uh, the MMR vaccine with autism. So, so 
Um, that has, has certainly added to public skepticism, has probably added to actual outbreaks. Um, that was retracted six years after it was published, and then 12 years um, it, was, it was fully retracted. Um, and if you, if you look back, um, the same issue that has its partial retraction also has a lot of, of articles bolstering it and saying, well, you know, we've looked at this, we've looked at that. Um, and, and that's a shame. Um, of course, you know, hindsight is 2020. Um, so at least I think what we can do is correct the literature after the fact. So that means things like making it really obvious when you have an article that's retracted to watermark it, to have the landing page say that. Unfortunately, that's still really not the case. Um, and it's not the case on, on journal sites, it's not the case in databases, it really needs to be. Um, and this is a problem we already can fix, we already know how to fix, so I wish we would. Um, we, we also have had um, some prominent problems in fields like uh, anesthesiology, where there have been um, so many cases of retraction of um, some just absolutely fraudulent authors that editors have written series of editorials thinking, what do we still know? How do we prevent these problems? What sort of statistical analysis? What's the sort of the statistical analog of plagiarism checking? Um, so I, I think that this is a place that uh, publishers also, there's a real opportunity to show value. Um, what is it the publishers are adding? Well, stewarding the literature and caretaking. And find me one, you know, find me one author. I, you know, I'm in information sciences. If there's anybody who's going to love uh, formatting citations, they ought to be in, in my field. Um, I don't know anybody who, who loves doing that. So caretaking uh, for bibliographies is something that absolutely authors are really delighted that um, it's something that the publishers can help with. Um, so but the, the state of, of things is that there are a number of articles um, that are heavily cited. And they're cited not just before they're retracted, they're cited afterwards. Um, and I've been following one particular case with a student of mine. Um, we're looking at a clinical trial that was retracted for faking data. Um, it's the only clinical trial on the topic. Um, beforehand, the, the literature has just been case reports, which have been really mixed. So we actually don't really know what the situation is. Is, is this the treatment proposed helpful, harmful? We, we don't know. Despite that, there are 134 citations to this paper. Um, of those 134 citations, three of them mention the retraction. Um, this is an article where the landing page doesn't say it's retracted. If um, you go to uh, CINAHL, the nursing site doesn't say in that database it's retracted. Um, and it's not just, just these articles that are spreading the false information, it's then all the articles that are citing that. So if you take that, that network of 134 articles and you look to those, uh, what are, are citing those, you get to 2,700 articles. Um, so this spreads really, really quickly. Um, and, and even, you know, even back in, in these 134, um, we found a, a French uh, nutrition textbook that was, was published within the past year that is, is still citing this article. I'm fairly sure that's not because they wanted to. If they think that they think it's, it's real, not one of these fake bricks. Um, this is a problem that, that we can solve. And I think the people in this room, uh, I think we have the, the skills and the data needed to solve it. I don't think it's a very hard problem. I think it's, it's a matter of, it's, it's really an organizational, structural sort of problem. Um, so as far as I can tell, we need a database of retractions, a database of citations, and then to do two things with that. One is to alert authors and editors before they finalize the bibliography. Um, do you know that this paper is retracted? Did you mean to cite it? Um, and if you do mean to cite it, mark it as retracted in the bibliography, mark it as retracted in the text. Um, but maybe you actually didn't want to cite it, but you didn't know it was retracted. That would be a really good thing to find out at the time of um, reviewing the article pre-press, um, at some point in that. You're already checking bibliographies in many cases to do linking. This is, if you had the data of what's retracted, this is dead simple to add into that process. Um, then the other piece of it is when a paper is newly retracted, notify the authors and editors who have already cited it. Um, was that used in a way that is important? Is this something that may impact the article, the findings of the article, the methods that you're using? So I really think it's, it's pretty simple to fix. Um, we do have a database 
the database, um, it, the Retraction Watch database has about 8,000 retracted articles in it, just finished very, very recently, publicly uh, available to search, um, something that uh, scholars can get access to just by asking. And from you know, commercial purposes, uh, that requires uh, licensing so that they can keep maintaining it. Um, my first question, being at a Crossref meeting, is why is this database not a Crossref database? Right? You're depositing your metadata. Um, one of the update statuses is you know, retraction status. And there are some retracted articles, right? about 2,000, 2,400 of them. But that's about a, a quarter of the ones that Retraction Watch is, avail is, is, is aware of. Um, so a question to you is, are you registering your retracted articles? If you're not doing that, why is that? Is that just a matter of nobody's asked you to, or is there some challenge in doing it? I, I really do want to know the answer to that question, so um, please, please talk to me about this later. Um, if you're using Crossmark, this is, is something that would work well with it, but even just depositing the metadata, even if you're not using Crossmark, it doesn't matter. Right? Other people, so I can, I can go and get data from the Crossref APIs as a scholar, right? My students are doing, like my student did that, looked, we looked at how many of the articles that PubMed knows are retracted, does, does Crossref, it's shockingly low. Um, it's really, really shocking to me, um, especially for, for, for folks doing medical literature. Um, so um, please, let's have a database, let's have Crossref data, the Crossref API, be able to be that database. Um, so the second thing that I think we need is a database of citations. Um, and I'm really delighted that Open Citations is starting to be an open database for that information. Um, as somebody who is a, is a researcher, um, yes, I can get um, citation information from Web of Science, from Scopus, from various places. But when I want to publish that information in a digital library application, uh, licensing issues become problematic. So open data is far, far, far more valuable to me. I can use it instantaneously. I don't have to worry about my liability, and, um, and it's fantastic. Um, so many uh, Crossref members are contributing. It's very easy to contribute. As of this year, um, it's open is the default. Thank you, that was a great decision. Um, and you can also check if you're, if you're a Crossref member or if you're not a Crossref member and you have a favorite journal, you have a journal that maybe you're associated with or you know someone at, um, you, you figure out what their publisher is, right? Or as a publisher, take a look at your participation results. If your references are not 100% open, is there a reason for that? Is that something that's necessary to you for business purposes? Maybe not. F figure that out. And ideally, if you can, set your citations to open. This is something that's really easy to do. Um, and, and you have you know, a whole back room full of people at the break who, who can, can talk to you about that. It's something you can do for all of the articles or you can do for you know, one, article, one article by one. Um, so overall, I really think making metadata a priority, um, not an afterthought. And so that's from my perspective as you know, with the metadata hats that I have. Um, metadata 2020 is a great place if you're just starting to think about what does this mean, what does metadata quality mean, what is completeness for our metadata. Um, figure out how to talk about metadata quality internally. Is there something, you know, wh what's, what's reasonable for you to do this year? Um, the participation reports that Crossref is, is providing can be fantastic information if um, maybe there's a conversation to have with, with your vendors. It may be as simple as a conversation, and if you, if you haven't had that, that would be the place to start. Um, so really overall, um, please, please, please take an active role in monitoring and tracking bibliographies. This is of huge value to scholars, in, and um, I think that particularly for thinking about uh, retracted papers, clearly mark your retracted papers. Um, before publishing an article, check its bibliography. Are there any retracted papers in that? Um, and then ideally we'll be able to alert authors who've already cited a retracted paper. Thanks.
Thank you. I found that really interesting. Um, and I just, I just got a bigger question about this is kind of related to really when something should be considered part of the scholarly record for others to see and use and when it shouldn't. And I'm just interested in, um, often the narrative around retractions has historically been um, about things that have been done fraudulently or, you know, they should have been picked up. They shouldn't really have ever been published. So that says something about the processes that of peer review and how the journals are managing that, but obviously some things slip through the net. But I'm just wondering about things that um, now we're finding lots of studies, particularly in the medical um, areas, that aren't reproducible um, for reasons that aren't necessarily fraudulent. Or how do you see they um, fit into this picture? Because obviously, something when is something usable and and should be seen and citable, and when when shouldn't it be? I think it's kind of a bigger issue here. Yeah, I've, I've thought a lot about other sorts of problematic citations. And other sorts of things that happen are when you have a very divided uh, network of authors or network of information about a topic. Um, and you may only be citing one part of that. Um, if you know that a study is not reproducible, uh, that, that it means that when you're relying on it, uh, you're, you're, there's a risk. There's a risk that whatever it is that you're using as the basis may, may actually not hold true. And so I do really think about the, the Jenga. So there are some pieces in Jenga where, okay, you pull it out, there's other stuff supporting. Um, but you get to the point where you pull enough pieces out in the, in the wrong places and the entire structure falls down. And that is just as true for non-reproducible research as for retracted research. Um, it, it's much trickier to understand multiple, multiple reasons for um, problems in reproducing. It, it, it is. It absolutely is. I'd love to talk more about it. Can yeah. I just people to introduce yourself first? I think Liz Allen is fabulous. Yes, Eleonor and Regina from Lithuania. And I, I like, thank you very much for this great talk. And because I know in Lithuania only plagiarism is a uh, research integrity topic, not. Uh, but do you think that okay, that's very nice proposal for publishers, for for those who collected the retraction. But do you think that research is responsible most? What kind of uh, reference literature included in the reference list? Yes, it is only of help but uh, for researchers, but not uh, final responsibility of publishers. Right. Uh, it is absolutely the author's responsibility, but it's also the author's responsibility to you know, type things correctly and to put figures in the right places, and it doesn't mean that we don't check. Um, this is, you know, the bibliographies are a place that requires a lot more checking. It's a lot harder to get right. And it's harder to get right in the formatting, but it's also pretty hard to get right in the content, especially when um, you, you go to look at, a, at, an, at an article and it doesn't s slap you in the face and say, oh, retract it. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Uh, I'll just note one thing. I did a quick search using our API, and um, there are over 6,000 items in Crossref where the title starts with the word retracted. And, and but if there, it, but we, we can't just use title searches. Oh, I know, I know. So so it would be a really easy thing to go look at those articles in in your collection as you're doing that and say, oh, should this be be marked as retraction? I, when you know, because retraction is a topic that you know you can retract a muscle, for instance. So there, you know you can't just use keywords to do this. We we actually need the data there. Uh, just to be clear, I agree with all those thoughts, and it is really a very good suggestion if publisher could alert researchers. But this is, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks very much. <laughs>